There are a few events in American history so dramatic that they have actually changed almost everything about this great country of ours. Uh, some in the auditorium this morning remember back December 7, 1941, the attacks upon Pearl Harbor that launched uh, America into World War II, a day that changed everything in the course of our history. And then all of us, most all of us, remember back to September 11, 2001, on that horrible, horrible day. Nothing is the same in America as a result of those planes flying into the, into the towers. Some days are that powerful that they change everything. I begin with that thought because according to our passage of Scripture this morning, another day is coming. A day so powerful in its impact that it changes not only our country, but every country in the world. You say, what day and what event are you talking about? Well, let's find out together. If you have your Bibles with you, and I hope you do, open please to Matthew chapter 24. As we continue our series, What Does the Future Hold?, looking this morning at the future's turning point. Matthew chapter 24. If you didn't bring your own Bible but want to read along, there's an extra one right there in the pew in front of you there, page numbers up on the screen. Here's the historic context. If you remember back, Jesus in Matthew chapters 24 and 25 is answering three questions asked of him by his first followers. Last weekend we saw in verses 4 through 14, he answered the question, is there a sign that will show us when the end of the age is going to occur? And Jesus said that there will be wars and rumors of war. He said that there will be famines and earthquakes and persecution. He says these are just the birth pangs. When you see these things like a contractions of a woman in labor. They'll start mild and infrequent, but when they get closer to the end, they will intensify into waves of painful contractions until the child is born. Jesus says, the end of the age, you're going to see these things coming, but there will be one event, one event in the future that will signal its time for those contractions to go into overdrive. Jesus told us what that event was, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 15. See it with me? Here's the one key event that's the turning point for the future period of history. Jesus said, verse 15, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolations, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, Let the reader understand. Now stop there for just a moment. That's as far as we're going to go this morning. What event is Jesus talking about? Well, let's dig in first and look at the biblical description. It's called the abomination of desolation. The word abomination uh, refers to something that is uh, detestable. Uh, something that is repugnant. It's used in Revelation chapter 17 of gross immorality, of pagan idolatry. So it's describing something that's not only gross, but something repulsive. So repulsive that at verse 15 causes desolation, abandonment, barrenness, desertion. So Jesus is talking about a coming event in the future that is so spiritually ugly and wicked and distasteful, so reprehensible that it will bring about an abandonment. Now, what is he talking about? What event could be so bad that it could change the world? Well, notice secondly the historic foreshadowing. Verse 15 says that abomination of desolation was spoken of through Daniel the prophet. Are you familiar with Daniel? He was a prophet of God. He lived in the 6th century B.C. 
Uh, he lived in the ancient country of Judah that was conquered by the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar. And most of the Hebrew young men were taken captive and into exile in Babylon. Daniel was one of them along with his fr three friends that took on the names Shadrach, Meshach, and, and Abednego. They're all up in Babylon now, which is modern-day Iraq. While he's up there, Daniel, the prophet, receives a revelation about this abomination of desolation. He speaks about it three different times. So in order for us to understand what Jesus was talking about, we need to go back and, and look at Daniel and what he said about it. So hold your place in Matthew 24. Turn back to Daniel chapter 11. It's page 767 in that pew Bible. The context of Daniel 11 is the story of how two ancient kings rise to power. They're the, the nations that surround ancient Israel. The first king is the king of the south who rules over Egypt. The second king is to the, the north of Israel, the king of the north, over Syria. In Daniel chapter 11, we're given an amazing prediction about one of the kings, the one of the north over Syria, who would come to power during this time that Daniel is going to prophesy about. Daniel chapter 11, let's dig in, verse 21. Referring to the old king of Syria, in his place, a despicable or contemptible person will arise on whom the honor of kingship has not been conferred, but he will come in a time of tranquility and seize the kingdom by intrigue. Most every Bible scholar around, regardless of her or his liberal or conservative eschatological view or view of future things, agrees this is a prediction of a Syrian king by the name of Antiochus IV. He comes to the throne of Syria, 175 B.C., when his brother is poisoned to death. So he comes via intrigue. We know from history that this Antiochus was a military man who hated Egypt and wanted to destroy Egypt. So he gets a massive army together to go down and fight Egypt, but is prevented from carrying out the war. In frustration then, he turns around to go back home to Syria, but he passes through Israel and pours out his frustration on the Hebrew people. Notice what he does, verse 28. Then he, referring to this Antiochus, will return to his land with much plunder, but his heart will be set against the holy covenant. It's a reference to all things Hebrew. And he will take action and then return to his own land. Now, what action does he take? Now, remember, Daniel is predicting this 400 years before it happens. He describes exactly what Antiochus would do. Verse 31. His forces from him, Antiochus, will arise desecrate the sanctuary fortress and do away with the regular sacrifice and they will set up the what abomination of desolation what did this man do the bible doesn't tell us but there are two historic books first and second maccabees that are recorded in what is known as the apocrypha that explain it. Antiochus comes into Israel pretending to want peace. When he gets there, he turns loose 250,000 warriors who massacre a good portion of the Hebrew people. Antiochus hates Judaism, and so he wants to stop the, Jewish, the Jews from practicing 
their religion. He takes away all the Old Testament books. He forbids them to keep the law. And then he goes into the Hebrew temple and places a statue of Zeus, the head of the Greek gods. He then builds his own altar over the top of the temple's altar of offering and sacrifices on that altar a pig that is unclean to the Hebrew people. He then forces all of the Hebrew priests of the temple to eat the pig's uh, meat, thus making them unclean. He commits the abomination that causes desolation because the people have to abandon the temple because it's become unclean with an unclean animal in it. 400 years before it happens, we read about this. Now, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15, Jesus says, another abomination of desolation is coming in the future. He was referring to something out in the distance. And by doing so, we have another illustration of the principle of double fulfillment that we often see in the scriptures having to do with prophecy. Oftentimes, God told his prophets about a first mountain of what would happen in a historic setting. Antiochus is going to come in set up a statue of Zeus, he's going to make it profane, he's going to commit the abomination of desolations. What Antiochus does then is the picture of what's going to come in the second mountain. Way out in the distant future, another ruler is going to commit another abomination of desolation. What's going to happen? When is this going to happen? Daniel 11 does not tell us. But Daniel chapter 9 does. So turn back just a couple of pages to a second reference to this abomination that causes desolation. Daniel chapter 9. Again in the context. Daniel has prayed to the Lord and asked, how long will Israel stay in captivity in Babylon? God answers his question by sending to him the angel Gabriel. Gabriel tells him in chapter 9, it'll be 70 years that you'll be there. But then Gabriel also gives him a revelation about the future of the Hebrew people way, way distant in the future. And he explains that second mountain. Notice Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, one of the most important prophetic passages in the Bible. Here's what Daniel was given, verse 24. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city. Your people is the Hebrew people, your city is Jerusalem. Seventy weeks, or literally as the NIV, seventy sevens. So what he's talking about is seventy periods of seven years, four hundred and ninety years. So Daniel is getting a revelation almost five centuries long of what's going to happen. In that 490 years, we're told, verse 24, that they would finish the transgression to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. A lot is going to happen in that 490-year period, especially the establishment of of everlasting righteousness. So the critical question is, when does that 
490 year period start? Verse 25. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, or the Anointed One is the NIV, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks, or 69 periods of seven. It, Jerusalem, will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. Daniel's given a revelation of 69 of those 70 weeks. So 69 times 7 is 483 years. That period would start with the decree that is issued to rebuild Jerusalem. We know that date. King Artaxerxes, Persia, what today is Iran, told Nehemiah, chapter 2, go back and rebuild Jerusalem. We count ahead 483 years, and it comes to the year when Jesus died on Mount Calvary, and the Messiah was cut off. We know the beginning, we know the end of those 69 weeks. Now, the revelation is not so concerned about those first 69. The revelation is really concerned with that last week, that last period of seven years. Notice what's going to happen during that time. Verse 26. After Messiah is cut off during that 69th week, the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and its end will come with the flood. Even to the end there will be war. Desolations are determined, and he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. That seven-year period of time, a coming prince is revealed. This coming prince in that last seven-year period of time, is going to make a covenant with the many. And the context would refer to the Hebrew people. We have no idea what kind of covenant he is going to make, but it's going to be a seven-year covenant, a seven-year agreement with the nation of Israel. Now, I want you to notice what that coming prince is going to do in the middle of that seven-year period, verse 27. In the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering, and on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate. A second reference to this abomination that causes desolation. Now, to be consistent then, we have to understand this abomination that's coming in the future will reflect that first abomination done by Antiochus. This prince who is to come. Jesus warns that future abomination is going to stand in the holy place. The holy place is the Hebrew temple. Now, There is obviously a huge gap between that 69th week when Jesus died on Mount Calvary until this future abomination takes place. A huge amount of time in between. But we're told that during this time there will be these birth pangs. But you get closer to that last seven year period and those birth pangs are going to intensify. And it's all going to be done by this coming prince. Who is that? Well, we know that this man, going to reflect Antiochus, most likely going to be a political leader of some kind. He's given a whole bunch of different names in the Bible. He's called the Beast 
in Revelation chapter 13. He's called in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the son of destruction, the man of lawlessness. He's best known by John's title given to him in 1 John chapter 4. He's known as the Antichrist. Are you familiar with that name? This is this coming prince. You say, Pastor, what will he be like? I'll say to you, come back next week and I'll, t- and I'll tell you about him. Suffice to say, if our interpretation of Daniel 9.27 is accurate, he's most likely a political leader who will come in like Antiochus and pretend to want peace with Israel. He sets up some kind of a covenant with Israel, most likely will last seven years. What is that covenant about? We're not told. There's lots of speculation about this. I think it's probably accurate if this first reflects the second. He will be some kind of a military leader involved in politics who will guarantee Israel's safety, I think, in the rebuilding of the Hebrew temple. We know the abomination of desolation occurs in the temple. There's no temple right now. And I think what this man is going to do is guarantee Israel the right to rebuild its temple on the Temple Mount. Right now, if you know anything about present-day Jerusalem, on that site where the temple was built, now stands one of the most holy Islamic sites in the world known as the Dome of the Rock. It's that gold-plated round top building. You think that'll cause World War III if Israel goes in, tears that down, and builds its temple right there? This is speculation. Are you with me? I think he's going to guarantee their peace that allows them to rebuild their temple. But then, like Antiochus did, in the middle of that seven-year covenant, he is going to do something so spiritually repugnant, so repulsive, so wicked, it's called the abomination of desolation. What is he going to do? Paul tells us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This man so arrogant and so deceived, he opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the, what? the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. He says, worship me, because I'm God. You think that is an abomination? Absolutely. That would desecrate the temple? Absolutely. And the thing that the Bible talks about of why people will follow this man is because he has a partner in crime, if you will, a religious leader who's known as the false prophet. And this false prophet will have supernatural power given by the devil. Revelation chapter 13 simply says that it was given to him, the false prophet, to give breath to the image of the beast. So some kind of image is going to be put up there of this Antichrist. And and somehow, this statue, this image, is seemingly going to come to life. So that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So we're talking about a worldwide impact 
You either worship me as God or you're going to die. Jesus says, when you see that, and Lord willing, we'll talk about this in a couple weeks. When you see that happening, Jesus says, run. Run. Because now, in that 70th week, that last seven-year period of time, God's wrath against man's sin will go in full throttle. The Braxton Hicks contractions will become massive waves of pain leading to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this seven-year period of time is so horrible. Jesus said down in verse 22, unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. We're talking worldwide destruction. Now, as I've said from the beginning, lots of differences of opinions on this. We're not going to fight about this. But I have convictions about this, and this is the theology of our, of our church. And I think it's the most accurate presentation over all of the scriptures. But what we're going to emphasize time and again throughout this whole series is what we all agreed to. Jesus is coming back. If you believe it, say amen. amen. With that in mind, let's conclude our time together here with the practical understanding. Turn back to Matthew chapter 24 with me. Verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, notice this little phrase, let the reader understand. Uh, we don't know whether Jesus spoke those words himself. Um, I don't know if you have a red letter edition of the Bible that puts Jesus' words in red, whether that is in the red or not. Uh, there are others who think that it's simply a Holy Spirit-inspired comment given to Matthew that was to be included in the scriptures. I tend to think that way. Uh, either way, Jesus says, in, in the future, if you're reading this, which we are, we need to understand uh, it's a command it's in the imperative mood, this verb noeo. It, it refers to think correctly, think accurately, understand what this is going to do and what this is going to be. That this coming event, because it changes everything. And so the practical application, see this is not meant just to fill up our minds with eschatological facts. It's not so that we can put it on a chart as helpful as those are. This teaching is meant to impact me and you and us this afternoon and all of next week. And if we understand it correctly, it will. So, what do we need to understand first? That God's Word can be trusted. I'm deeply, deeply impressed that God gave a revelation almost 500 years before it occurred, so exact that many, many liberal scholars say Daniel could not have written that prophecy about Antiochus because it's too accurate. Well, beloved, all it is is a simple example to us that when God says something, It'll come to pass. It might take a long, long period of time, but when God says something, you can trust it. Numbers 23, 19 speaks to this. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do it? Has he spoken, and will he not make it good? Of course he will. 
He doesn't lie. And when he makes a promise to you and me, we can put our full weight on that promise. So what promise are you holding on to this afternoon? That God is with you? He says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. You may feel very, very lonely, but you're not alone. You may feel like God doesn't love you, that you are a massive failure. Doesn't mean it's true. Don't believe everything you think. Put your full weight on what God has told you. He can take the worst event of your life, the worst day, the day of the divorce, the, the day of the diagnosis, the day that you failed so miserably, the day you committed the crime, whatever. He can take those days, and as terrible as they are individually, he can actually use it to accomplish something good and positive. Because my God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. If you believe it, say amen. Lean on it. Just lean on it. Understand that God's word can be trusted. Secondly, understand that God's saints should be encouraged. This study is meant to encourage you and me that life is going to get better in the future. But not here, up there. There are tons of things that discourage us in this life. A, a, a relationship that struggles. Kids that abandon the Lord. Grandkids that get upside down. Parents that get old and turn into different people and their personalities change and they become stubborn and angry. And Anybody know what I'm talking about? We, we, we try and diet and we get discouraged. I mean, it's, it's just part of life. And when bad things happen to us, we cry because we're human. But this whole study of prophecy and what we understand about what's coming is meant to be an encouragement to you and to me. This, that this place is not our eternal destiny. The Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, when he comes back, we will live together with him. Beloved, you're going to heaven if you know the Lord Jesus Christ. And your present may, may look really bad right now. Your future looks glorious. And he's coming back to get us. Our destiny is not this wrath of this seven-year period. But we're going to go through terrible times and those birth pangs. We all go through them. But he's going to keep us from the wrath to come. Therefore, Paul says, encourage one another and build up one another, just as you are doing. So many of you are walking with the Lord. I would just tell you, keep going. I need you, you need me, we need each other to encourage each other. Don't lie, don't cheat on the exams. Tell the truth. Admit what you've done. Celebrate the victories. Live for the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he's coming back. And we need to build each other up. Don't compromise. Keep your eyes fixed on him. Keep waiting for him. Don't fall asleep. Who's this for this morning? Keep going with the Lord. All of this was meant to impact me and you and us, that God's word can be trusted, that God's saints can be encouraged, that God's people have hope. It's important to know that this seven-year period of time, the first three and a half years known as the tribulation, the last three and a half, the great tribulation, 
This period of seven years was designed especially by God to purify the Hebrew people. You're going to read that in the Old Testament time and again. And during that seven-year period of time, as God's wrath is poured out, there are many, many Hebrew people who are going to trust in the Lord with all their hearts. But it's going to be a terrible, terrible time. It's described in Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 7, Alas, for that day is great, there is none like it, and it is the time of Jacob's distress. That seven-year period often, time, often called the time of Jacob's trouble or Jacob's distress, but he'll be safe from it. God's going to work in the Hebrew people. Daniel had a similar, similar revelation of this, chapter 12 and verse 1. Now at that time, Michael, the archangel, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise, and there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book, will be rescued. So God is going to call out from the Hebrew people an elect group who are going to be regrafted into that holy stump of David. They're God's people, the apple of God's eye. They always have been, and they always will be. He has a plan for them. And Paul said in Romans chapter 11, that on that day, all Israel will be saved. Just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. God's people have a hope. And if you're from Jewish ethnicity, I would simply tell you, to follow Jesus of Nazareth does not mean you have to stop being Jewish. I didn't have to stop being Irish. You don't have to stop being German or Mexican or whatever. God has a plan for you and for your people. He's made promises, and he's going to keep them. And what you need to do is the same thing that everybody needs to do. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why God gave a message through Isaiah the prophet about this Messiah, the suffering servant who came for you. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquity. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his or her own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Anybody here this morning, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. You've got to repent of your sin. It's killing you. It'll separate you for all eternity. And the offer is extended. You have to receive it as a free gift. The Bible says that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Have you called upon the Lord? That a message of repentance for the forgiveness of sins is to go forth from Jerusalem, said, to all of the earth, this is our message. Your sin is killing you. Put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's borne that burden of your sin. He drank the full wrath of God for my sin. He drank that cup dry so that I and you and we could be forgiven. Anybody here this morning? I'm so sorry, Lord. Forgive me for my sins. I want to turn to you and believe in you, and I want to follow you. I want you in my heart. Please forgive me. Anybody this morning? Jesus, save me. Hope you will. That's what this is about. That God's word can be trusted. God's saints should be encouraged. That God's people have hope and that God's enemies are warned. 
you choose not to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, then know this. I have no idea when this seven-year period is going to start, but it will be the worst period of time in human history. And if you say no to the Lord Jesus Christ now, and we enter that period, you can still believe, but it will most likely cost you your life. And that's why we get so much pleading throughout the scriptures, especially from the great apostle of the Gentiles. Second Corinthians 6, 2, Paul said, Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. I pray that you won't leave this place without making up your mind. You don't want to go through that time. So believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. I hope you will. Let's bow our heads together. We'll conclude our time. All right, everybody take a really deep breath together. There's been a lot here. Clean hands and pure hearts. No idols. My biggest idol is me. Wanting to climb on that throne each and every day. I'm sorry, Lord, forgive me. Forgive us. Pray that you would continue to speak to your people and that you would call us to live in purity and in truth. Oh, help me, Lord, to be ready. Help us. This day and this week, should you return. So, to that end, we'll leave this with you. Anybody this morning, Jesus, save me. You call out to the Lord. The Bible says that as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Receive that gift. Jesus, I want that. Forgive me, I'm sorry. You come on down here afterwards, I'll give you a Bible. Don't be afraid. Lord, continue to speak. We entrust this word to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.